Psych with Mike Studios for this first ever Psych with Mike podcast. For those of you who may have already been familiar with Psych with Mike, you know who we are and what we do. For anybody who may not be familiar with the show, uh, Psych with Mike was a project that originally started as a radio show in January of 2017. And we were on the air in St. Louis, Missouri for the entire year of 2017. But at the end of that year, my sister-in-law had a stroke. And at that point, it became difficult for me to continue to do the show and devote the kind of time to it that I wanted. And so we closed it down. And recently, I had the opportunity to have a conversation with a very good friend of mine, Mr. Brett Newcomb, and we had talked about wanting to do a project together for a while, but had never pulled the trigger on that. And so we started talking about what it would be like to put the show back together and doing it ourselves. And it made a lot of sense to use the technology that exists today to revamp the show as a podcast. So I am your host, uh, Dr. Michael Mahan. I have a clinical practice in St. Louis, Missouri. And with me today is Mr. Brett Newcomb. Hello. And Brett uh, and I, our history is that Brett was a graduate professor of mine and then a professional mentor and now one of my closest personal friends. And so I appreciate you being willing to do this project with me. Well, I'm glad to be here. I think it has had considerable interest to us for a long time. We both have been in private practice. We both have done supervision for other therapists. Uh, We both have taught courses at universities on how to be a therapist. So the the interest and the passion for both of us has been around for a long time. We've just tried to find an an organized approach to getting a message out about what therapy is and, and how to do it well. And I think also it is fair to say uh, and accurate to say that both of us really, really love the idea of presentation and being able to present a complex idea in a succinct way that other people can understand. Both of us really enjoy the opportunity to get in front of an audience and to give them that information in a way that is meaningful and that they can apply to their lives. Yeah, I was a teacher for many years before I became a therapist and it always was a frustration for me to have to, as a requirement for teaching, attend seminars or presentations when we had speakers that weren't very good speakers. The content of their information might have been absolutely fine, but it's just incredibly irritating to be forced to sit and listen to someone that doesn't know how to present. Right. So I, I used to uh, have a regular reaction every every August when teachers come back to the school districts to go to work, the school districts have a presenter to sort of get them pumped up for the new year, some new topic, some new trend in education, something that would improve the quality of their performance or their interest or satisfaction in their job. And year after year, the information may have been fine, but the speakers were really bad. And I kept saying, you know, I could do this better. I could do this better. And then, fortunately, I got hired by a couple of school districts to do the beginning of the year presentations uh, for a number of years. And the feedback that I got was that, indeed, I was doing it better, simply because I was a better speaker, not because my information was any better. So that sort of supports the thesis that it's important to be able to present the information for people, and that's what we're trying to do here. And I think that everybody who would be listening to a show like this would know and have the experience of being in a room and having exactly that happen to them where the information that somebody was giving them was good, but the presentation was not engaging. And that quality of being engaging is, I don't think, something that can be taught. Now, you may disagree with me, but I think that people who naturally have that talent are probably born. I think it can be honed, but I don't know that it can be taught. Uh, You know, that's, I don't know. I haven't really thought much about that, but I I know that when I was in high school, I started taking classes in public speaking and debate, was on the debate team. In college, I took speech classes and was on the debate team. Uh, And I did become uh, a public speaker and a presenter. 
I have done workshops for major corporations. I've done workshops for school districts, uh, classrooms, uh, it, and I think I have become a somewhat confident uh, presenter. Though uh, the proof, I guess, is in the pudding, and so people will make their own determination as they listen to what we have to say. Right, but you know, were you attracted to those opportunities because you innately were a speaker, or were you placed in those opportunities and then taught how to be a speaker? My guess is is that you were innately attracted to those things, and then your skill was developed, but that if you had not originally been innately attracted that wouldn't have happened. You know, that goes back to I mean, thoughts that I had when I was a child. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a child growing up, I fell in love with the English language. Mm -hmm. English is such a beautiful language, and it's comprehensive and complex, and and the rhythms of the spoken word. I used to read out loud a lot. We, we did a lot of oral things in my classrooms growing up as a kid. We would had to memorize sections of poetry or plays and, and declaim them, essentially. Uh, and we heard it, we paid attention to it, we listened to it. And when I was younger, I had opportunities to be on radio and television. I had a radio show when I was in college uh, and hear myself through this medium and get criticized about what I was doing well or not well. So it, it uh, has always been a fascination how to put ideas together and communicate them in English in ways that impact other people positively. So. That may even be a show for another time, this whole idea of nature versus nurture and what are the ways in which people develop and do we develop in a way that is preordained by our genetics or are we more susceptible to the influence of our environment. But that isn't what we're going to talk about today. Well, and or how much control we have over that. Mm -hmm. Because that is one of the ongoing arguments in our field is, is how are, how much are you constrained by your genetics and how much are you constrained by the scripts that were written for you as a child by your environment, by your parents. And we both, I think we both still believe that the scripting process of our childhood lasts us a lifetime. It's very hard to overcome those scripts. I've worked with so many individuals and families over the last 35 years who were stuck in a script that didn't work for their life. So that is what makes you a professional, is exactly that ability to make that transition because we went from the nature versus nurture argument to what we wanted to talk about, which yeah. is our professional orientations. We wanted to take this first show opportunity mm -hmm. to be able to explain to people what our philosophies of psychology are so that they would understand where we're coming from. So if you had to name most precisely the theoretical orientation that you subscribe to, and we'll explain what it means so people don't have to worry about the jargon, but what would you say that that is? You know, that's a really hard question for me to answer because it's, uh, I've always said I am not as much an academician, even though I taught at the university for over 30 years, as I am a practitioner. And my approach to practice is the importance of attending and creating a safe uh, environment for someone to get in touch with their emotions. So there are different labels that mm -hmm. have been applied to that over time and, and as I've evolved and, and learned things. I remember when I was in college and I took courses in abnormal psychology. Every single area of abnormal psychology, psychosis or schizophrenia or what have you that I studied, it would occur to me that either I or somebody in my domain suffered from exactly that. Oh my God, that's my mother. That's my next door neighbor. That's my wife. That could be me. How many people in graduate school <laughs> did we see yeah. who would, you, you could tell when You'd you were see the lecturing. lights go off in right, their head. And, like, and, oh, right. wow. <laughs> that's what it is. Yeah. So, you know, I, my, my approach, my terminology has evolved and changed. I, I guess the closest that it would come to modern terminology would be experiential. Mm -hmm. uh, because my focus is on watching for the patterns that I see as people do or don't get in touch with their feelings. Uh, the nonverbals are really important in getting into, I mean, I think there's a, a, a bifurcation, a dichotomy mm -hmm. uh, between uh, our head and our body. And our bodies are communicating with us all the time. And you know, not verbally, you cannot not 
communicate. Mm -hmm. And so as a trained therapist, you watch for the communication of the body when it's incongruent with the communication of the words. And you start to gently invite people to be aware of, of exactly that uh, uh, disconnect. So you've, you've thrown out a lot of concepts. Yeah. So let's try and, and make sure that everybody's on the same page with us. So when you talk about attending yes. and being in the room with another person and creating that safe emotional holding environment, that actually is very Carl Rogers and very humanistic. So those qualities were expressed by a man named Carl Rogers yes. in humanistic psychology. And then you apply a lot of those. So even though you don't, wouldn't necessarily consider yourself a... A Rogerian? Right. No, I you, wouldn't. Right. But, but you do use those qualities of what Rogerian psychology talks about. And, and I'm just, I'm, I want to clear this up so that, yeah. that people who may not have, you know, doctoral degrees in psychology could actually, you know, put labels to these things. They could do their own research. So that's a very Rogerian technique. And yeah. then the, the experiential, that goes more into like ex existential psychology, right. which Irving Yalom or, um, I'm blanking on his name, uh, lived through World War II. Uh, I, know, I don't know who you're talking about. Uh, uh, the father of uh, existential psychology in the United States. Um, he uh, lived through World War II and... Uh, I'm thinking Rick, Victor Frankl. Victor Frankl, Frankl. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, or did you did you you knew that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so that's that experiential piece. Now, I actually subscribe to a philosophy that a man who was a contemporary of Carl Rogers at the University of Chicago, Heinz Kohut, Heinz like the ketchup, Kohut, K O H U T. Oh, I know Kohut. Yeah, very you well. You introduced yeah. me to him. Yeah. So uh, when I was in graduate school, I was very very cognitive behavioral. And you introduced me to the concepts of psychodynamic theory and specifically object relations and even more specifically Heinz Kohut and self psychology. And that's all a stratification of similar theories, but more specifically going down so, into. So what you're doing is describing a trace chain to go mm -hmm. back intellectually to put grounding under what you do every day. Mm -hmm. But when you're in the room with a client, you aren't thinking any of that terminology or any of that etiology. What you're doing is you're thinking about what is this client saying? Mm -hmm. Where are they hurting? How are they hurting? How can I interact with them in a way that helps them find a better path forward? Right. And so you're not saying, well, is this a Kohutian intervention or a Rogerian or an Exxonian intervention? Right. We studied all of those people to learn techniques that we could use but to it, it incorporate those techniques into our presence with a client who's in pain. Right. Or, or anger or frustration or whatever the emotional condition is. But we've all, you and I, I say we all, you and I have had this conversation before that one of the things that is, I don't want to say infuriating, but frustrating to us yeah. is when people that we talk to who are supposed to be professionals say, well, I'm eclectic. Well, they're causist. Yeah, and, you know? and, and they do a thing, and yeah. they say that they do exactly what you do. Well, I don't really oh, yeah. think about what I do in therapy. I just kind of do therapy. But if they can't explain what their theoretical orientation is, what their foundation for how they understand human pathology is, then what are they really doing? They're not thinking very deeply. Um, I remember when I was getting my training 35 years ago, I worked with a guy that was had a gestalt uh, therapy focus. And he was so proud of himself because he would give homework assignments uh, to his patients, you know, some esoteric and exotic kind of thing that were just designed to try to break the rhythm of their daily functioning and survival. But he'd feel very arch when he would say, well, they didn't understand it, but they didn't need to understand it. They'd just go out and do whatever I told them to do. But he had a lot of control issues. Mm -hmm. He had a lot of ego. He had a lot of power problems. He didn't do really good therapy. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that was more about him yes. than it was about his client. When I used to have some of his clients come to see me later because they, they found it not very satisfying mm -hmm. uh, or helpful. And so they would come to see me and one of the first questions they would ask is, do you give homework assignments? And I would say, do you need homework right. assignments? And if you do, we can make some up. But I don't tend to use them 
in my work because mm-hmm. in my experience people don't do them and then they feel anxiety or guilt when they come back to see me the next time because they didn't do what they were supposed to have done right. and that gets in the way of getting to what the underlying issue in their life is right now as far as just homework as a concept in psychotherapy goes yeah. you know it isn't about whether they do their homework or not it's about what they either get out of the experience or if they don't do it. What they can learn about why they avoid it. Yes. You know, what's the resistance here? So so then there's a concept in our work called leaning into the resistance where you and I don't argue with them about them or shame them or attack them or guilt them because they didn't do it. But we say, what's the payoff? You know, I, I tell my clients all the time, you every choice that you make costs something and every choice that you make pays something. So let's talk about emotional economics. Mm-hmm. What do you get out of avoiding having this conversation with your wife? Mm-hmm. You know, do you get more stress? Do you get more anxiety? Do you get less satisfaction? What do you get if you have the conversation? Maybe you get clarity. You may get a divorce. You may get huge fights. You may get a lot of pain and crying and carrying on. But if you move forward in the ability to communicate honestly, I do marriage counseling and talk to people about my job here is not to make sure that you stay married. My job is to try to make you stay happily married. Mm -hmm. And for that to happen, each one of you needs to be self-honest. You can lie to me, you can lie to the other, but you have to be honest with yourself if you want to make progress here. What do you see in this person that you want, that you like? What are you willing to do to get that in your life and keep it in your life? So you talk about emotional economics. And... One of the, the, the primary foundational concepts that I am focused on when I do therapy, and we were talking about this uh, on the drive over to the studio this morning, is emotion regulation. And the idea for me in that is that all of us learn our emotional regulation in the first 18 to 24 months of life. So before we're pre-verbal. Even before we have scripts. Exactly. Yeah. We learn through modeling. So we have this idealized exterior object. So the parent, the idealized other, you're laughing, but. <laughs> I'm laughing because I've heard your son call you his idealized yes. external object. Yes. So you talk this way at home. Yes, I do. Uh, <laughs> and much to the chagrin of my my wife and my children. Um, but we develop all of this before we even learn how to talk. And so if we are dependent on the model behavior of the parent, the, the idealized external object, and we introject that, so that's a psychology word for, we take that into us and we make it our own, and then our rules about emotional regulation are dependent on that model example. If the modeled example is bad or wrong, then what we carry around with us all of the rest of our lives is bad, wrong, or ineffective. Well, especially if the parental introject that you make is an angry one. Mm-hmm. If you have the anger, then you have shame because that is I'm always bad. Yes. So um, talk to us about the difference between I'm going shame to make and guilt. Mistake. Well, the the difference that I try to explain to my my patients is that shame is a script that someone else wrote for you to control you, to control your options, your choices, your definition of the experiences that you had. You're bad because you broke my dish. Uh, even though it was an accident, even though you were, you, maybe you're clumsy, maybe you trip, maybe somebody scared you, whatever, but you broke my dish and you're bad, and so now you have to suffer. And in anticipation of being bad, people suffer a lot. They, they tie themselves in knots emotionally, mm-hmm. and it makes them less able to relate or have intimacy, because why would anyone want to be available to me for intimacy if I'm a bad object or right. a bad person? And so, so specifically, shame is the script, I am bad. Guilt is the script, I have done something bad. Guilt comes out of a sense of personal integrity. Mm-hmm. I feel guilt when I have not done something that I require myself to do. I feel guilt when I have done something that I feel badly about having done. You know, I shoplifted, and then later I feel guilty about that. I have all kinds of rationales for why at that moment I took that, but later I feel really badly about it because I am looking at myself in the mirror. And so guilt is a personal feeling that comes from your sense of personal integrity, your sense of self. Shame 
is a feeling that comes from a message that you were inculcated or incorporated in uh, from your uh, parental interject. So we are attending to our clients. We are monitoring the verbal versus nonverbal behavior. So you had talked a little bit about that. And I wanted to go back to something that I was thinking about when you were talking about that is that most people don't recognize that only 15% of human communication is the spoken word, 85% right. is all the rest of the stuff, the right. nonverbal Facial behavior. expression, tone, gesture, right. posture, yeah. And, and yet we live in a society that is predicated and on the idea of, of texting. Yeah. And I have this conversation with my clients all the time. You can't read nonverbal behavior into a text. If you do, that is a projection. That is not about the other person who sent the text, that's about you. And it doesn't matter how many emojis are in a text, that is not a substitute for nonverbal behavior. But people just have such difficulty being able to accept that. They want to believe that they know the emotional intent of the sender. I just read an article today that was posted from Time Magazine about how people in the world are having less sex than they've ever had. Teenagers, 50% of the teenagers in Japan claim that they're virgins. American teenagers, uh, less than 20% of them are having sex in a year. Married couples are having less and less sex. And one of the explanations as the article did the research to, to uh, underpin or justify its conclusions one of the explanations is the existence of portable technology. People are taking their cell phones and their iPads to mm -hmm. bed, and they're laying together alone, interacting with their device instead of with their partner. And that whole thing about what we call mediated communication, we go through an inanimate object, the, the cell phone, the mm -hmm. iPad, what have you, instead of learning to communicate with the person next to us. Because 85% of our communication is unavailable. Mm -hmm. If I can't watch your facial expression, your right. eyes, your body tension, your smile, the aura that you are communicating to me with, then I miss all of those components in our connection. And so from my perspective, I have difficulty, uh, well, I wonder what it means to our society to think in terms of we have more intimate relationships with our devices than we have with other humans. And if that is so, what does that mean for our emotional regulation? It means we have less of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you watch people flood with anger or rage, throw their phones against the wall, punch a wall, drive like idiots, uh, aggressively hostile uh, reactions, in part because they don't have any experience or opportunity practice in attending to other beings. And so they are out of practice attending because they don't do it often enough. And then yet they still expect, at least in my experience, they still expect everyone else to be very good at attending to them. And so we have this expectation I see in society where we expect people to accommodate us, but we don't feel like it is important for us to accommodate others. And that goes back to self-psychology and the messages that you uh, develop about your sense of self as a child. And your need to express yourself and to regulate your emotions is critical. Mm -hmm. And your success in life will uh, depend a great deal on your ability to do that. So if you just attend to an inanimate object, if you a computer keyboard or a cell phone or an iPad or some other device like that, you're not attending to the people around you, you're in the danger zone. You don't see when there's danger, when there's anger, when there's risk coming your way. Uh, and you don't see when there's affection and mm -hmm. happiness. You, know, you walk into a room and somebody's eyes light up and, and you know it's like hi honey you're home mm -hmm. not because they say it but because you feel it right that soothes you or arouses you or energizes you in a way that says i have value i have meaning and we all need that so if there was a takeaway message from what we are saying 
then would you say that it is to work on try and hone practice your own ability to attend to others in your environment and try and recognize their nonverbal behavior and what that nonverbal behavior is saying to you, not just what their spoken messages Absolutely. are. Absolutely. There's a, there's a sweatshirt, a t-shirt, a, a page of cartoon faces that are mm-hmm. identified by emotions. This mm-hmm. one's angry, this one's sad, this is disappointed, this is whatever, uh, amused, funny, that I used to hand out to families when they were seeing me for counseling. And I would ask everyone in the family, look at this picture, look, look at mom, mm-hmm. and look at this list of photographs and tell me which one is closest to what she's feeling right now. Mm-hmm. Mom, don't say anything. Mm-hmm. Let's all just look at mom and see what, what we're getting. And then we would discuss it and we would agree with on, on what we thought it was, and then we'd ask mom, is that it? And she'd be like, no, mm-hmm. no, I'm not, right. I'm not sending those messages. Right. Well, she may be the one that's out of sync because right. maybe she is sending those messages. Uh, I remember years ago, there was a, a study that was done in a school district in Chicago with young black teenagers who had teachers that were afraid of them mm-hmm. because they were big and they seemed angry and they seemed aggressive especially the female teachers were afraid of them and so as a result they were getting sent to the office or the dean and suspended from school for all kinds of behaviors they were enraged about that because they said i'm not doing those things Mm -hmm. so then a teacher got a video camera and filmed them and filmed them learning how to smile Mm -hmm. with their eyes and their mouth and their face and he teach them uh, taught them to say things to the teachers like, it was really helpful, young guys. Say, I don't understand this math problem. You explained to me that they would smile and say, that's really helpful. And within a nine week quarter, the assessment device that was given to the teachers, look, tell me about this boy in your class, changed from predominantly negative to predominantly positive. Mm-hmm. And the only intervention that was done is they were taught to smile mm-hmm. and to interact with eye contact mm-hmm. and a smiling face and a message of appreciation. Mm-hmm. So we're not just saying attend to the other people in your environment and try and pay attention to the nonverbal communication because it's so much more robust, right. but also to attend to your own yes. nonverbal communication. And is your nonverbal communication actually transmitting the message that you intend? Yeah, because I'm, if somebody says, well, you look angry, and you say, well, I don't have any sense of being angry, and they say, well, I was sitting here really feeling as if you were angry with me. That's really useful information for mm-hmm. you. Because then you can go inside and say, am I mad? I mean, again, being honest with yourself, am I mad? Right. And, and if so, what? And what do I want to do about that? And, and sometimes you discover that, yeah, you, you were angry and you didn't realize it was leaking out. And you can then say to your child, you know, you're right. I am angry, but please hear me. It's not with you. It's about something that happened at work today. Mm -hmm. But you're picking up that, and I don't want you to take ownership for it. You haven't done anything wrong. You're not in trouble. I'm sorry that you experienced it, but it's not about you. And that makes that child feel Mm -hmm. safe, makes that child uh, feel seen and understood, and it helps you get in touch with what's what's your issue here. And, And the nonverbal leakage that we all do, that we don't know that we do. Right. And so to wrap up this episode, uh, I think both of us would agree that the things that we are saying are things that we encourage people to try and do. They may find some benefit from these things. Uh, They may find that they have difficulty doing it, or they may find that because of the scripting that they received when they were very young, that everything that they are interpreting is backwards and kind of upside down. So we're encouraging people to take some of this information and try and apply it. But if they find that they're still not getting the results that they want, what we're doing is not in any way a substitute for going and finding a professional to sit down with them and get good psychotherapy. Well, yeah, and and a good professional will have a way to approach that conversation with you so that it doesn't sound accusatory, it doesn't sound scolding, it doesn't sound angry. Uh, I mean, one of the things that I learned to do uh, was to offer the hypothetical interpretation. Is it possible? Because I, mm-hmm. I think this is what I'm seeing in your nonverbals, and this is the way I'm interpreting what I think I'm seeing. So can you check it out and let, let me know, am I seeing it accurately? 
So then that person is asked to do something that they're not used to doing, which is consider what's going on on my screen that the world is seeing. So, yeah. So uh, if you want to interact with the show or you want to have more information from the show, you can find us at uh, psychwithmike.com. You can follow me on Twitter, Dr. Michael Mahan, uh, at psychwithmike. You can find us on Facebook, at psychwithmike. If anybody ever had any questions that they wanted to pose to us, you can get a hold of us through those forums. And we look forward to being in your ears next time. Have a good day. This is Dr. Michael Mahan and, and Brett Nickel. We'll talk to you next time.